Hey everyone, it's Naomi Wolf, um, Facebook Live, and I wanted to uh, take a moment to talk about um, some erasure, like a very serious issue that uh, I've started to write about involving the erasure of histories. Um, I, and this has to do with the forthcoming, um, the forth coming release of my book, Outrages. Uh, so as many of you know, Outrages is about um, the story of John Addington Simmons, who is a largely forgotten hero of the LGBTQ rights movement. He was a Victorian uh, critic and scholar who um, was uh, basically had to choose self-exile and silence because he was coming of age at a time when um, it was becoming always in new ways legally dangerous to write about homosexuality, which is a word that is kind of ahistorical. Um, we, we need to think of it more in terms of same-sex offenses because homosexuality was a word and an identity that came later after the rise of sexology at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but Simmons was kind of tragically for him uh, born too soon in a way, and he was a great romantic, um, a great uh, believer in the power of love. He fell in love as a teenager with uh, an, another young man or a young a youth whom he only called W uh, in his poetry. But by the time he was 21 and a student in Oxford, um, the death penalty ended, uh, but it was still punished with sentences at hard labor for 10 or 15 years um, for men to be in relationships with other men, to commit sodomy with other men. And the law kind of mutated. And this is something that, that interests me very, very much because bad law does this, you know, over and over. And the, the British 19th century really kind of perfected this. The law kept mutating so that um, at first, you had to prove sodomy, you know, with penetration. Then it was a crime to have sodomy even, or, you know, or with ejaculation. Then it was a crime to have sodomy with just penetration. Then it was a crime to, um, for men to just meet together. And then the crime of conspiring to commit sodomy uh, became actionable. And so, and then you got, you know, the law kind of twisting around so that, yes, the death penalty ended in 1861. And by the way, many news outlets misreported last May when my book came out and was canceled in, in America. Um, uh, many news outlets, including the New York Times, misreported that men had not been executed in Britain for sodomy. They had. 56 men had tragically been executed for sodomy in Britain in the 19th century. Um, but even when the death penalty ended in 1861, men were getting, and, and teenage boys were getting sentences for 10 or 15 years lifetimes at hard labor um, for the crime of sodomy. And why do I care so much about this history? Um, you don't have to be a gay man to understand how important this history is because the 19th century and British colonial history specifically was a century of experiments on how to control populations. So we take for granted that the state has the right to um, tell us who to sleep with or that the state has the right to tell us if we can or can't have an abortion or the state has the right to tell us um, you know, to monitor our words or to censor our speech or to see what we're doing on our computers. That those methodologies of managing populations came from somewhere and they came from Britain in the 19th century. Um, in addition to criminalizing homosexuality, Britain uh, innovated with censorship. Again, we take censorship for granted, but you know, that it's always existed, but it hasn't always existed in the sense that it exists today, the modern state, the secular state, not saying, you know, this is blasphemy, this is heresy, but saying, you know, you just can't say this. Um, it's against this or that censorship law. But Britain basically invented modern censorship, um, taking 
uh, inspiration from France. Uh, there had been a famous trial, the Madame Bovary trial in 1857, and Britain subsequent to that passed um, the Obscene Publications Act, which criminalized speech. And this is really an erased history in many ways. Uh, we, we think of the, you know, the 19th century as one in which there was inhibition and people were um, self-conscious about sexuality, but it was actually illegal to write about sexuality. And people who were selling, you know, books and materials ranging from, you know, classical narratives uh, that were too graphic to pamphlets about contraception um, were being arrested. And booksellers were going to prison, sentences from two to four months at hard labor. A uh, famous bookseller named Henry Vizitelli was really, his health was broken in prison, an elderly man, for selling the, the book Nana, which is now considered Zola's Nana, which is considered a, uh, a classic. So that's, that's the background of outrages, and that's the background of this amazing hero that I write about, John Addington Simmons. And I'm, I'm very, very excited that Chelsea Green is bringing out outrages in North America, because as some of you may know, it was canceled last year, and um, I had made two errors. But uh, the the you know overall argument is completely intact, and in spite of that, um, it was canceled. So this revised, expanded edition, which I really showcase a lot of work by uh, extraordinary LGBTQ historians like uh, Professor Paul Johnson, um, H. G. Cox. Uh, um, Sorry, there's so many people calling in. Uh, amazing writers like Charles Upchurch, Graham Robb, uh, who have, have fully proven that men were persecuted very savagely in the 19th century for same-sex sexuality. Um, I really shine a light on, on their work, which everyone should know about. Now let me speak about, briefly, erasures. And I'll be talking more about this on Facebook Live um, sessions and presentations, but uh, one thing that was really striking to me in researching outrages is that the, the scholars who have written books that are real books, they're behind paywalls very often because that's how academic books work, or they're in libraries, um, people like Professor Upchurch, Professor Cox, Tr Graham Robb, they found thousands of committals in the 19th century, and as I mentioned, dozens of executions. And the source for that is the statistics of the parliamentary papers, um, as well as uh, cross-referencing contemporary newspaper accounts of trials with court records. So that's a really um, solid methodology, right? They didn't take just one source, they cross-referenced. And they found this record of horrific persecution, thousands and thousands of people um, arrested, um, you know, dozens of people executed, as I mentioned. However, when you look at a resource like the Proceedings of the Old Bailey, which is a really, you know, elegant, fun, costly digital uh, database that you can get right onto, it's free, it's funded by the British government, and it takes uh, the proceedings of the Old Bailey, which aren't actually court trials, but are kind of sensationalized accounts of that courthouse, and they uh, make it searchable, which is very exciting and very cool. However, something really interesting happens when you search things like sodomy, <laughs> um, and you search death sentences, for instance, in relation to sodomy, or you search uh, sodomy to see how many people were arrested, what kind of... Um, sentences they had at the Old Bailey, you get many fewer results. And in fact, you get only four executions in the course of the 19th century for sodomy. So that really made me think, uh, and I'm not trying to censure or, or judge the proceedings of the Old Bailey at all. It's an amazing resource. And the historians who run it try to warn people that it really isn't complete. The thing is curricula in schools are being made out of that database, which drastically undercounts and underrepresents the persecution of men for same-sex intimacy and sex in the 19th century. Whereas the, the books with the correct um, 
numbers, uh, the ones that I mentioned, of thousands of arrests and dozens of executions are behind paywalls. So what this has created, and I really saw this in the controversy about my book last, last spring, is that untruths about history like this constant repetition in serious newspapers like the New York Times, I mean, it's still up there on Google, that men were not executed for sodomy in the 19th century by the dozen, um, that became the conventional wisdom that was repeated and repeated on social media, on free platforms, in free news outlets. However, the fact that dozens of men were and that thousands of men were arrested for same-sex offenses um, was buried, it was inaccessible. So I've done a lot of further investigation and it really is happening right now that history is being erased. Um, the, and, and this is happening through digitization and I'll, I'll speak more about this in a follow-up talk because it's so, so important. But basically, and coronavirus you know, makes this much harder, you can't get to a library, you know, and physical books and physical libraries are increasingly inaccessible. Everything's digitized. However, people don't understand that digitization doesn't give you everything in a completely neutral way. When you have a database like the Proceedings of the Old Bailey, you know, what you tell your developers to, to create in terms of search is what, what you get when you search. Um, we have a database called Daily Cloud. I run it. I'm the CEO. And we can tell our search functionality to count pro-life and not pro-choice as terms, as search terms. And as, as someone searching abortion or reproductive rights will get many more pro-life results than pro-choice results if that's what we tell our developer to do in the search function. So search is not neutral. And that's one way um, with digitized archives that, that results are being skewed, that history is being erased. Um, another thing I, I have found is that archives that used to be in the custody of librarians and custodians of archives who are trained to be curators, neutral, apolitical, um, like the National Archives in Britain, like the National Archives in Australia, and increasingly the National Archives in the United States, these are have been shifted over to the custodianship of partisan government officials. So people with an agenda, a political agenda, people who are part of one political party, and you know that opens the door to what you can imagine is now happening, which is that, I mean, in Australia, the National Archives are run by the Attorney General which is extraordinary because FOIA requests, you know, for National Archive material is being vetted by the Attorney General. I mean, it's a complete conflict. And the same problem in Britain, um, and where you get uh, partisan government officials overseeing what are often digitized National Archives. So then what happens, as you can guess, the Guardian has reported on the fact that thousands and thousands of records from the National Archives are going missing. What are those records? And that how are they going missing? Government employees are borrowing them and not returning them, which is kind of a crazy thing to have happen if you've got digital archives in the first place, because there's no such thing as borrowing them if, and not returning them. So they're being erased, they're being culled and elided. What has gone missing? According to The Guardian, um, many thousands of records of colonial atrocities um, have gone missing and, and are just gone. And I think if we look under the hood in country after country, we're going to find a lot of missing records or a lot of gaps in records. Um, I was in Ireland and uh, in a really renowned independent bookshop, um, the bookseller called a historian, a local historian, because I was looking for 19th century records of um, imprisonments. And he said, oh, those, those are missing. You know, thousands and thousands of them are missing. There was a, there was a fire. <laughs> and, you know, I found in South Africa that there was a fire, you know, for a lot of records um, from the era of fighting against apartheid in the 1970s. So a lot of natural disasters going on, um, erasing records 
around the world, but also digitization just allows technology to erase records uh, silently. You know, send, you don't have to burn a book to set an algorithm to just not find something. And the last thing I want to say about this, but really I'm going to go more deeply into it because it's so, so important, especially with coronavirus. My fear is that we're going to emerge uh, with huge chunks of histories lost and it'll be 1984 where it's always the present and the state is always right. Um, there's a, a, a final element, which is for-profit companies are buying up uh, archival records. So it, if you try to look at British libraries, it used to, you know, at British journalism from the 19th century, it used to be the British library owned it, and that was a neutral custodian. It's been bought up by a third-party for-profit company, um, and third-party for-profit companies have no obligation uh, to have records be complete, to have them be accessible, or to, you know, to have them be transparent. So I'm really noticing that you can easily access journalism from the 19th century about Christmas or about women's rights or about fashion, um, but you can't as easily access records about, you know, poverty, um, capital punishment, uh, child labor, um, the things that might not be so pretty to remember, but that are so important to remember. So that is my riff about erasures of history. Um, the book is Outrages, Sex, Censorship, and the Criminalization of Love. I really urge you to, to read it, buy it. Chelsea Green has published it. I'll embed the link, but you can go on Barnes & Noble now or Amazon or bookshop.com and order Outrages by Naomi Wolf. And let's talk again soon. Um, I'll make sure to get a tripod and good lights. Uh, and I'm going to follow up about erasures of history and more details about this incredible story um, in outrages of John Addington Simmons, a really inspiring uh, hero of the LGBTQ rights movement and, and a hero of um, freedom of expression and human rights generally. Thank you so much. See you soon.